So our next presentation is, um, I feel like I can call you Bob now, since we Please. spent all this time together Please. with Bob Field. Bob currently serves as the Director of Safety and Security for Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Hamilton, in Hamilton, New Jersey. I'm sorry about the New Jersey. That would, I, oh my, should have read my notes first. I personally like the Jersey accent. He has over 34 years of military, federal law enforcement, and private security experience. Today, he will discuss how healthcare professionals can reduce or eliminate acts of aggressive, disruptive, and violent behaviors. Bob, Mr. New Jersey, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Well, good afternoon. So I don't know how I'm going to be able to uh, continue on after this uh, banter, I guess, Peter. <laughs> um, but in that stall moment, we're talking about these accents in Boston and, and then New Jersey at the bottom. So some of the connections, obviously we're here about connection and, and interacting and building those partnerships and relationships. So some of my connections are, we heard from Eric from Virginia, and I was actually born in Virginia, so there's ours. And uh, Lynn with Louisiana, that's where I had my first legal drink, so uh, <laughs> there we go. And then as far as Massachusetts, thanks for welcoming me back. Actually, uh, I'm a retired Coast Guard, and I spent uh, late 80s, early 90s at Station Woods Hole down in Cape Cod. So I lived at uh, Otis Air National Guard Base in Bourne. Uh, and had a lot of fond memories driving back up into this area. Uh, and then in my latter part of the career, I retired out as a special agent criminal investigator with Coast Guard Investigative Service uh, post 9-11 in the terrorist world that we live in now. And I spent some time out of the Boston office uh, prior to my retirement. So thanks for having me back. So I don't know where I stand with the accent. I don't know I'm going to gain, gain it back in uh, the short amount of time. Uh, but I don't think I really have that strong Jersey accent that everybody hates. So uh, we'll get through it. Uh, but absolutely, the important part of my presentation is about the safety and security awareness. And this is a topic that really everyone struggles with on how do you get a handle on it, how do you truly deal with the issues that we experience in, in our hospitals and amongst the uh, clientele that come in, whether they're family members, whether they're patients, whether they're our colleagues. Um, it's sometimes a very terrifying place. And I jokingly said earlier this morning that uh, through my career, I've I can handle those brawny fishermen out of New Bedford. I can handle the drug cartels out of the Caribbean. But you put me in a room with a bunch of nurses, and I get very scared. Um, and, and, but healthcare is, is a different environment. And so the awareness that uh, I'd like to share that's, um, I guess, caught me some attention that allows me to come speak to you is I kind of think out of the box. And a lot of that comes from my military background in the Coast Guard with going out on search and rescue missions and all the things that I've been involved with over the years, and then entering into healthcare. So I've been in healthcare 11 years now at two different hospitals uh, and have experienced quite a bit in just that short amount of time, but I'm still a young baby in, in the healthcare arena. Uh, but what really fascinates me to, still to this day is when events occur, when you get those, and I hate to be out of politically correctness, but if I say the frequent flyers that we all know come and go, um, when it's that Friday night in the ER, it catches my attention that every time these things happen, the staff react as if it's the first time, and they don't know what to do, and they just are at a loss. And even when you have issues with belongings checks or can I restrict visitors, we go round and round with can we, can't we, I don't know, but we got through it before, and why can't we you know, understand it a little bit better? And when you put it in the context of the emergency management, we've been through a lot of real life situations over the years. And we still struggle with that even because we've learned from things and we do have great takeaways, but we still unfortunately struggle with why do we lose control of that? And as Eric you know, established early in his presentation, that when you're planning for things, other things come up, but it all still dovetails together and you can still pick upon things that you've learned and use those resources and not lose focus that it's uh, something brand new for the first time. And then as the partnership, as Alain, uh, shared the fact that we want to build partnerships and relationships with your coalitions and your different hospitals. And the struggle in healthcare and the landscape of changing and the merges and the acquisitions, we still need to just look at what's the purpose of our safe care providing services and, and drop those barriers and understand that we're here to work together. And we do that at this level and we do that at the hospital bigger structure level because we have been working together. But when I put it into the context of a hospital itself, 
we still live in silos inside those hospitals. And that's where my change of thought process comes into the environment to engage with nursing on safety security matters. Whether they want to know or not, I'm going to share the right information with them. And as I continue my presentation, I'm definitely not an expert in this topic. Uh, what I consider myself to be is a well-rounded, well-informed professional regarding the security matters. And having that different take and bringing it into an understanding that the staff have the awareness, it allows them to uh, further become a safer environment. And I do want to share, Campus Safety Magazine is in the audience. Uh, Campus Safety Magazine is a magazine that provides information for security professionals in the higher education level, as well as um, uh, school level, as well as hospitals. And I was fortunately awarded the Director of the Year for all the hospitals across the country last uh, July. I went down to Washington, D.C. and received that award. And some of the information that brought me to that um, uh, being nominated and then fortunately being awarded was in my hospital that I currently work at, I reduced the disruptive behaviors by 42% in one year. And when I presented this to our board, because my CEO was flabbergasted and he said, you've got to come talk to the board, I immediately told him that it's not that we don't have issues in our hospital. It's not that we've stopped it. It's not that the drunks aren't coming in, the uh, uh, overdoses aren't happening, the violent disruptive behaviors aren't happening, those family members that won't stay out of the pantry is still happening. All those issues are still happening. But what is really happening to reduce that amount of disruptive behavior or need for security is staff now feel comfortable and empowered to handle the situation before they have to call security and have us deal with it, or before you call local law enforcement and then get them involved. So having that awareness and then the confidence in the staff to do it and not say, well, that's not my job, because it's all of our jobs to stay safe. So that's where I'm going to go with the presentation. So the objectives that I'm going to talk about is that awareness of hospital safety security. And every time I do a presentation, I always do a quick Google of hospital violence. And I, again, I want to thank Campus Safety because for about a 12-hour window when you Googled hospital violence, my picture popped up and it said, hospitals doing great in reducing violence and you know, takeaways. But then 12 hours later, that was gone and now we're back to what we see. So today I Googled uh, just before I came up to see what's out there. And, there's, and under the news feeds, you'll just see so much about we need advocacy for nursing. We need to make sure it's a safe environment. We need to pass laws. The hospitals are out of control with violent, disruptive behaviors. So the awareness has to be out there. And then how do we reduce that? And then the security police involvement, because that becomes a problem or a disconnect where staff don't understand how or uh, what we can provide. And then illegal street drugs and the opioids. And then the active shooter, or what's known as killing. Uh, so a lot of information. I'm going to talk very quickly. I please don't think that my speaking fast is to minimize any of this, but I do want to get through some of these topics. So safety awareness. Violence in healthcare has been on the rise for several years. We know this for a fact. It's been Joint Commission published back in 2010. They put out Alert 45, said this is happening. That was nine years ago now. Uh, they just put out another update last April saying, what are you doing about violence in healthcare and what are you doing to protect your staff? Uh, study, a lot of the studies when you talk about violence in healthcare, there is really no solid concrete information, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, the information here from 2011, 2013 is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that shares the fact that across all industries, 24,000 annual workplace violence occurrences happen. 75% are in healthcare. Very alarming, but what's more alarming is that we are the least reported in industry. So, what is really happening? How many ER nurses, not to pick on them, but how many ER nurses say, well, it's a Friday night in the ER, what do you expect? I've been kicked at, I've been spat at, I've been scratched, I've been punched, my hair's been pulled. We have to stop saying, well, that's part of the job, or what do you expect, or it's no big deal. We have to report it so the right numbers get out to the right congressional level at a overall hierarchy of the National Hospital Association down to our local hospital associations, to our local boards, to our CEOs, senior leadership, where we can then understand that this is really happening. A survey out of uh, Michigan, this is a little bit dated information as well, but 21% of nurses that were surveyed in that report was 50% reported being verbally abused, and 21% were assaulted. And most of these are occurring within the ERs. More patients are presenting, as we know, with undiagnosed mental illnesses, the addictions, uh, the crisis that they're in when they show up in our ERs, and even if you're not uh, a psychiatric hospital or have those specific line services, they are presenting themselves, and we have to be prepared to handle them. And then violence can be perpetrated by anyone, so it's not just those patients, it's those difficult families, and as well as our colleagues. 
So in my research, to try to give you some value of information of what's happening here in your state, I am partial to New Jersey, and that's where most of my knowledge comes to, providing support to those New Jersey hospitals. But a recent Massachusetts Nurses Association survey that had come out was 220 of their union members uh, had found that violence and physical verbal abuse was widespread in Massachusetts hospitals. So what are they doing about it? What are you doing locally about it? What is your security staff doing about that? More than 85% of nurses have been punched, spit on, groped, kicked, or otherwise physically verbally assaulted. Shouldn't be surprising. If it is surprising, you're probably newer in healthcare than I am, because I was quite surprised when I joined and said, this happens, this goes on. And then the last part is 19% of nurses say their employer was supportive, which is great, because we want the backing of our facilities, institutions, and the laws within our states to provide that support and that protection and guidance and service to us. But 76% still say that their, their hospitals or their senior leadership or their direct management are not supporting them or providing any oversight on how to reduce or eliminate that. How, much healthcare, how can healthcare professionals reduce or eliminate the acts? And I usually put this into the perspective of my background in emergency management, and I say it's the same four methods that's used, and that's mitigation, your preparedness, your response, and then your recovery. And when you put it into that context, you're looking at the mitigation is what can you do to prevent something from happening? So can I lock a door? Can I put a card access reader on there so no one can get in? Can I put a light up here so it's not so dark? Can I do something that makes a change? If you have a reception desk where staff come in, or excuse me, sometimes staff, but maybe it's a, a client that comes in and they're upset about a bill, and they're pounding on that desk, but next to them is that pencil holder with the scissors and the stapler, and now it's something that they could use as a weapon. Taking that off that counter at your front reception window is a mitigation process. And then you want to be prepared. So the things you can't change, because we cannot change and make 100% everything perfect and safe. So we have to prepare for what would happen, what could happen, and have those healthy discussions, very short, 30 seconds, hey, what if that patient comes in upset about their bill and does this? What if? Don't hyper-focus, don't become paranoid or fearful, but just have that healthy thought, what if? And then how would you respond? So what if? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go out these doors. We saw earlier there's the exits. Uh, we can make sure we know what to do. And then ultimately is the recovery, because now you've got to go back into that environment. So if it is something very upsetting, something more um, concerning of a, a true physical assault or harm, how do you go back into that space and do your job uh, without fear of, oh, oh, it's Friday night, and what could happen again? Right? So that's the whole component of second victim, a whole other topic in healthcare that's really taking some uh, momentum. So situational awareness, heard that term earlier in some of the presentations, and that is absolutely starts with you and your work environment and yourself. And understanding what you can do, what you contribute to, and what you can handle, as well as the others around you in the environment. So in my presentations, I ask staff in smaller groups to think of a color, and we have some discussions. But just very quickly, think of a color, and then describe that color to yourself. Give some adjectives there. And then the same for an animal. Think of an animal and describe that animal. Now, the psychiatrist clinicians, I'm not going to put you on the spot, in, but some of the experts say the color you describe is how you see yourself. How you describe it is you. And then the animal is how other people see you. Now, I don't know if that's true, uh, but I did, it did ring true in my descriptions. Uh, but put that in context. And the reason I ask you to, to think about that, as well as how did you get when you were a child? Did you stomp your feet and hold your breath? Did you fight with your siblings? Did you become the perfect angel and manipulate? And the reason I ask that question is because this is often how we do it as adults. We will go back to that same five-year-old temper tantrum. So when your patients, your families that are coming in are acting out, demanding, and treating us poorly, they're going to that five-year-old attitude or, or status. If somebody becomes sullen and withdrawn and don't really engage and not making eye contact, that's because that's how they dealt with issues when they were younger. So it does manifest itself. So that leads to perceptions, and we have to just cover this quickly so we have an understanding of what perceptions are. And that's the way we think about things or we have an understanding of things to be. Uh, some pictures that you might be familiar with from different uh, literatures and processes here. But this is a picture or drawing of a woman. Does anyone see an older woman? Anybody see a younger woman? Anybody see both? I see some head nods. I was told the other time I did this, I see a horse. Now, I'd never seen a horse, but now I'm starting to see a horse. How about in this, perceptions? The dot, the little circle, is it the same color across the spectrum or is it lighter on the left and darker on the right? They're all the same color. They're all the same color, it's the background that's different. 
And then this one, if you could read along with me, I'm just going to read it here. A bird in the hand, Paris in the spring, once in a lifetime. How many read that? Put your hand up. You're all wrong, just like I am. Take a look at it again. It's a bird in the, the hand, Paris in the, the spring, once in a, a lifetime. The reason I put those up there is because the perceptions are not always what we all experience. So when you're calling for security to respond to that nursing unit for that disruptive patient, you've experienced it, this is what you witnessed, and this is what you're perceiving, and you know, understand that situation to be. You call security, it takes a little bit to get there, which adds to the frustration, but they have to get there. Then when they get there, usually the situation has changed. The patient's now sitting on the bed, they're not running their mouth, they're not doing what they did that agitated you to then call security. And then you look at us and say, you're not doing anything. Get it. We're looking at, well, what do you need? Because the perceptions are different. We perceive that the person's sitting there behaving, and you perceive they just kicked the IV pole and threw their tray. And we have to understand that. So don't be so quick to jump to those perceptions. Treat every situation as a brand new um, event and report it accordingly. Same when we get those unfortunate, I'll say the word, frequent flyers. Friday night, over and over again, you're always back. Here's the meds you're seeking, whatever it might be. But what happens that Friday night, they show up with true chest pain and absolutely are in a, a medical distress situation, but you say, oh, they're here every Friday night and it's because of this. We have to look at every situation, as taxing as it is sometimes, brand new. By doing that, it'll allow you to have a better understanding and relationship of what we can and cannot do. So for security officers, you have to understand the facts. And I always say you have to understand, you don't have to agree with it, but facts regarding security. Security officers are not police officers, and that's when everybody says, well, what good are you? So what good we are is a very professional department that can be that liaison to the other services that are need needed, whether it's law enforcement, EMS, fire, um, and the like. Security officers have no more authority or jurisdiction than any of you as a private citizen. So when people say you need more security, we could always use more security. We, could have, we, we need a police officer in every street corner in our world now. It's not going to happen. So all of you in this room now have the same powers as me as a security director, security officer, so be part of my team. I'm not asking you to run down halls and chase people and tackle them and interrogate them, but I'm saying take some ownership and support and assist. And when you look at the you know, terrible situations of active shooter events, if somebody was to burst in these doors and start to do that terrific harm, somebody, one of us, any of us, all of us, are going to do something to take action. So why can't we do that same mentality of all or one of us or some of us take action when it's a very simple, won't stay out of the pantry or won't stay in bed? Why do we immediately dismiss that and say call security and then we lose focus of what the real concern is? Security officers are to observe and report. You know, if they're trained properly and have that professional background and attitude and development, they can do that. Massachusetts is one of the rare states where security guard license is not required. Uh, so right now, currently, you can be a security officer in the state without a license. Uh, in New Jersey, there is a licensed state. In 2006, 2007, they became a licensed state. But it doesn't apply if you're a proprietary in-house uh, department. So if I worked at Walmart as uh, a loss prevention, I don't need a license. If I work in a hospital as security, I don't need a license. But if I work for a private security company, say Securitas, U.S. Security, and I work somewhere, I have to have a license. There is movement in New Jersey to change that law so it's required for everyone. But in, New Jer excuse me, in Massachusetts right now, there's no requirement to have any type of formal training or certification that you're a security officer. <clears throat> police officer involvement. This adds to the other frustration when you call for police. Uh, because when something's happening in your ER, and I'll use that as the examples, the frustration level of staff seeing that combative patient, call, call the police, call the police. The police come in and they kind of stand around and do this. And that frustrates the staff because why aren't you doing anything? You're not supportive. And then it builds or erodes those relationships and it builds that frustration again because why aren't you doing it? Because you, the person that's experiencing it in the ER, I want that person drug out of here, taken to jail, and off of my unit so I don't have to deal with it. And the police are looking at it. They're in crisis. They need to be in a hospital. They didn't really do anything that I can have ownership over to take any type of action against. And that's that disconnect. So you have to understand the police assistance, which is understanding individual states have their own criminal justice code systems. Uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, general laws or session laws or sections of session laws that are uh, permanent in nature and of general application. So that's what governs what can be done. 
And the general laws are codified according to subject matter in multi-volume publications entitled, uh, entitled The General Laws of Massachusetts. In Title I, crimes and punishments are listed under those chapters that are there. The police officer involvement. So this is out of the Massachusetts statute. Uh, assaults or assaults and batteries on emergency medical te technicians, ambulance operators, ambulance attendants, and health care providers. So there's already a law in place that says it's against the law to harm any one of you in the course of your duty. And that's a housekeeper, it's the dietitian, it's the security, it's the maintenance guy or gal. Anybody working under the umbrella of Auspice of Healthcare in Massachusetts is protected. And it will be punishable further than just a standard citizen on the street corner that might be subjected to those types of behaviors. So the piece about police officers and understanding, if, if you believed everything that was on TV, you got it all wrong. And if you knew what really went on behind the scenes, it'd be very boring because it's not what you see on TV. So you have to understand when police officers can make arrests under, the, uh, under the, their auspice throughout the country and what their, their duties are. So a police officer can only make an arrest when he or she sees the actual crime occur, first and foremost. So if they didn't see it, they can't do anything. So I use the example, you're in the ER and I slap you, and you say, call the police. And you tell the police, she slapped him, or he slapped her. Police officers kind of like, well, and? Because under our, our, our structure of the governance of our laws, it's your responsibility to swear out a complaint. And then further investigation occurs. And then they look to see due process. And you're the one who has to report it because it's you that was the victim. So that's where hospital employees will come to me and say, hey, Bob, this happened Friday night. Can you call the police for us? I'll call, and I have the relationships with them. But the end of that conversation is, tell them to come in, talk to me, tell them to fill out a report, because I, they can't do it just on my word. So staff have to understand they have to be engaged in that. The other piece to police officers making an arrest is when they have probable cause, which is more common. And that is when it's more likely than not, more probable, then they have the authority to make an arrest. So if I have a red face, and I'm pointing, saying, she slapped me, and there's a witness saying, oh, yeah, you should have seen it. She came over there, and if it was me, I would have done this. You have all that totality of the facts. The police officer can then say, you know, it's more probable than not that this did occur, and he or she then can take the action to make that arrest. But nine times out of ten, they don't in the hospital setting because they're there for care, and they're there for other needs, or they're in crisis. So a lot of times they leave, and the staff still feel abandoned or frustrated that nothing's occurred. But what they don't know might be happening behind the scenes is they're pursuing uh, informational pieces or they're getting a, uh, an arrest warrant to seek further guidance and support after the fact. What the staff don't know about that. I've been on some instances where a substance has been found in a patient room. We go into security. We get the local police. They come in. Yes, there's drugs here. We all do our thing behind closed doors. We leave. The patient's still in bed. Staff are like, what, what's going on? Well, they don't realize that they were just handed a summons that said, when you get discharged and you're safe and you're healthy, in about three weeks, come back to the courthouse and we'll deal with you. They don't know that that piece happened. And that's where we have to share information and, and not just run off and, and start our job and forget about what just occurred two minutes ago. But let the nurses know, hey, the patient's there. We had a talk with him. He does have to appear in court next week. At least it gives you some satisfaction that something is happening. And then the majority of arrests that are made in the United States are through a warrant. So that's the administrative paperwork and very boring, other than the warrant squad fugitives uh, uh, task force that are going out. But for you and I, it's like nothing's happening. But you don't realize there is a warrant issued for that person's arrest. And they'll be dealt with in the criminal sector. So law enforcement in HIPAA, we heard about HIPAA earlier. That's that fine line of can I say something, should I not say something? And basically, uh, law enforcement trumps HIPAA. Law enforcement trumps HIPAA. It's in their guidelines and their doctrines. But it shouldn't be the frontline staff that says, yeah, this is what's going on. Know that we can disclose information, but you should have a channel in your hospital of who should be disclosing that, whether it's the security director, manager, the risk management. It has to be contained. But don't just say, hey, the police show up and they're looking for somebody and say, I can't talk to you, because we can talk to them. So reducing violent disruptive behavior, some of these things are just those simple tasks that we learn uh, in our handling of patients, verbal de-escalations, different skills. And one of the things that frustrates me as a leader uh, is when I look at audiences like this, there's many, many years of seasoned experience here, and I thank you guys and gals for what you've done and do, but why don't we have those 20-year-old nurses? Why don't we have those 22-year-old security officers and those 23-year-old wannabes that are hearing this and then can have an understanding 
of why leadership acts the way they do or responds in certain aspects. Because we don't share that knowledge until we get to a level that we kind of already know it. And then we just reinforce it. Yeah, this works. And then some of us in these audiences say, yeah, I know that, but I'm retiring next year, so I'm not buying in. Then we've got some people that say, you know what? That makes perfect sense. I'm going to do it. And it works. And then we've got some that are just so set in their ways because we brought you here after 40 years. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. So if we can get the younger generations of our population of employees into these settings, share this information with them, they will be absolutely better off. And that's what I've done locally by going into those nurses' units and taking five minutes to talk about a search, talking about a belongings check, talking about what I can do for you and what I can't do for you. And it really shares and, and supports each other because sometimes security will come back and say, why doesn't nursing just tie them down? because the security officer has no knowledge about Department of Health rules and regs on restraints and the purposes and the protocols and the timings, and they just want them tied down because they're tired of going up every 20 minutes. And you're yelling at security, why don't you do something, because you don't understand. So we need to break those barriers inside our hospitals. I'm going to skip through the verbal de-escalation because a lot of this is uh, just common sense things, but if you're not familiar with just how people react or respond, anger and fear are the two emotions that really drive negative behavior. Uh, we experience ourselves in our daily lives. If we become angry and frustrated, we uh, you know, manifest that and then share that. So these individuals that are coming into a hospital usually are fearful and angry. And now we're there to deal with them, so we can't take it personal. We need to make sure we have an understanding of that and understand how to rationalize and handle those situations. Because if I'm a nurse and I had a call out and now I'm covering more patients than I am supposed to and I'm taxed with everything I'm doing, I'm angry because I'm here alone. I'm angry because that person called out again. I'm fearful because am I going to miss something and give the wrong medication because now I'm so distracted. So now that person, that good, honest employee is fearful and angry. And now you come around the corner as a colleague and now they snap at you or lash out. We all go this, through these emotions. So we have to keep ourselves in check. When you have these types of emotions, it could be an internal conflict or an external conflict. Internal is I keep it to myself. Um, Outwardly, as I'm banging my fist, I'm pacing, I'm screaming and yelling. Who do you think is the most dangerous person in those types of situations? The inwardly person or the outwardly person? Inwardly. It's that person that you got to be worried about is the quiet one. You ever hear that in growing up? Watch out for the quiet ones. I was very quiet. Um, but the person that's throwing and having that tantrum, again, that five-year-old hissy fit, they are releasing energy. I'd rather them kick chairs and throw things over there all day long and come into my environment here. But if they're very quiet and I go up to take their blood or read their uh, um, vitals, and now all of a sudden I get a fist in the face because I wasn't aware and they didn't tell me they were going to hit me, you need to be aware of that. So verbal de-escalation skills is manage your own de-escalation. Because once you get in these situations, you're going to become a, a problem. And you're going to have to manage yourself. And it depends, again, on background and perceptions. If you're an only child, grew up in a very quiet household, but then you come from a family of 10 and dinner time every Friday is a food fight and screaming and yelling and cussing and hollering. That person that experiences somebody screaming and yelling is really going to say, no big deal. But the person who's so secluded or doesn't have that type of uh, an upbringing, the first time somebody yells or screams at them, oh my goodness. So you have to balance that and understand how you can do that. Demonstrate a calm, professional manner all the time. Absolutely. And the louder a person becomes, the quieter you should become. The person who talks the most is going to lose. Just become quiet and let them continue to vent. Position yourself in a manner that's always safe. Get yourself by a patient door so you can get out if you need to. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid to scream out and yell and run. Rather be safe than sorry. So don't be embarrassed. And it's not, you're never going to be thought of less as a professional or a care provider if you do this. We want to make sure you're safe. Use colleagues to assist and support. And that's what adds to the anger and fear is because you want me to what? you got to share the load. And if every time I go in the room, I upset the patient, and they get mouthy or wordy or they throw their pudding, then why do I keep going in the room? Maybe they have a great rapport with the phlebotomist or the patient care tech. And let them go in and do that simple task just so you don't you know, poke the bear or, or disturb the hornet's nest. So we want to make sure we do that. Report all disruptive and aggressive and violent behaviors. Until you start reporting it, you're not going to have a full understanding of what is happening in your institutions and then what measures are needed to either prevent them, mitigate them, or what drastic changes have to take place to uh, absolutely stop them. Do not accept this, this, uh, disruptive behaviors as part of the job. It's not. We didn't sign up for this. Uh, statements like it's no big deal or I've experienced worse, 
We don't want to hear those things. And we need to communicate that out to nursing. Report it, report it, report it. Document all negative interactions, the date, time, involved witnesses, so we have a clear understanding of what occurred. And know your organization's protocols regarding reporting um, to your workplace violence committee, disruptive behavior committees, uh, human resources, security, and outside resources. Absolutely, in our organization, we've promoted that every call to the police have to come through the security department, unless it is truly a life-threatening 911. Because many times we've had units that have called the security, or excuse me, the police officers on their own from the ER or other units, and the police have shown up, they stop the security, obviously, and say, hey, we're here, what do you need? And then we kind of say, well, we didn't call you, and who called? And, and then it breaks our relationships, because then the police feel that we don't know what we're doing on our campus. And lo and behold, we send the police away, and then the units will call and say, we called the police 10 minutes ago, where are they? If you had called us and let us channel that, we can then absolutely give you better support. So illegal street drug opioid, uh, getting into this topic, obviously it's a very concerning topic. Uh, we're seeing this crisis nationally. Uh, so there are often misconceptions regarding the terms of opioid and opiate. The terms are often used interchangeably. We just say it to say it. Opioids are synthetic and partially synthetic, meaning the active ingredients are manufactured or they're chemical strains. Opiates and substances derive from the poppy plant. And common opiates include morphine, codeine, uh, thebane, and paramorphine. We're going to jump into on the street. Heroin may re be referred to as a synthetic, a natural, or a semi semi uh, synthetic compound. Manufactured opioids like Oxycontin and sometimes referred to as synthetic heroin. Heroin is originally formulated as technically an opioid since it's chemically manufactured. And although the molecules of the opioid plant, uh, the opium plant, are used in the process, some heroin's active ingredients are not found in nature. So I took these off the Department of Health uh, website for, for Massachusetts. Again, I'm more in tune with what's happening in New Jersey with the drug trades, uh, the trafficking through the state, and what's going on with them. But I looked at these from Massachusetts just to have a comparison and an understanding. Uh, and what you're really seeing here is, again, that opioid-related overdoses that are occurring. Uh, when you look at the red, that's the estimated uh, number. When you look at the gray, those are the actuals. And unfortunately, you're seeing that uptick in the expected or estimated overdoses due to this. <clears throat> when you look at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health opioid-related overdose deaths, this is a 19-year stretch from 20 to 2018. You can see it continue to, to escalate up. And what you're seeing in that 2013-14 time frame is more the advent of the use of Narcan. More and more Narcan hit the street of being able to be used. It can be, uh, it can be uh, purchased now. I think there's only two states left that you need a prescription for it. Uh, but you can absolutely get that over the counter now. With the advent of getting that out on the streets and into you know, everyday citizens' hands, people are now being able to revive these individuals, uh, which may not be adding to the numbers that are being calculated as far as those that are experiencing the overdoses. When you look at the overall makeup of male or female, this again is for Massachusetts, um, you've got a 1181 for male and 436 for female, so heavily use in the male population. When you look at the ages, a lot of people think it's like an experimenting drug, I'm in college, uh, let me try this, try that. When you look at these opioids and the issues of the heroin epidemic, it is not the 21-year-old college kid trying something new. When you look at that age range, it's, it's the middle class people of the world that are working. It's that 35-year-old to the 55-year-old. And, and the reason that they are really subjected to this is not because they're from an inner city population with all the negative uh, stigmatisms. They are unfortunately caught up in the pain, the pain of aging, the pain of medicine, the pain of ac accidents, and their prescription plans are running out where they can't afford it. <clears throat> but you can go buy that bag of heroin for $5, and it will ease my pain for twice as long. And that's why they're getting it, and that's why they're using it. But what's happening in the overdose component is the advent, unfortunately, of fentanyl and carfentanyl. So heroin, if I'm a heroin addict, and I know if I go buy this little bag of heroin on the street for 10 bucks, it'll give me a good fix and get me through my day for the next eight hours. With no issues, I can tolerate it, this is what I do. The drug dealers are now mixing fentanyl and carfentanyl with the product. So when you're finding the overdose scenes, when uh, uh, police are going out and doing the investigations, they're finding the product that they go back and test in the laboratories are maybe only 10% heroin. 90% is fentanyl. So I'm buying the bag that I know I can tolerate and got me through for the last year, but the bag I bought today is full of fentanyl and it kills me immediately because it immediately sends me into an overdose. Uh, overdose. 
And when you look at the granulars, heroin is, is that bottom of the vial is all covered with the white. When you look at fentanyl, you've got the scattered little um, droppings. When you look at car fentanyl compared to the dime, that one little dot is enough to kill you. It will kill a human being. It's, car fentanyl is an elephant tranquilizer. The reason this is such a big thing is because it's not illegal. I can go on the internet right now and buy fentanyl for $12,500 so I can max out a credit card, order it, ship it to my house, cut this up and sell it, and in two weeks I can make a $250,000 return on my $12,000. So I can pay off that credit card and no issue. The reason it's legal is because it's, un, it's very difficult to get the chemist and the DEA and, and our customs officers in line with the component. So you can buy it in China because it's man-made. Once it comes through customs and DEA and they, and they define what it is, then China will then change the molecular structure, one little nano, which then doesn't meet the element of what the law is for it to be illegal, so now it's legal again. So it's a cat and mouse game. So it, once they say this is illegal, you go on the dark web, you can't buy it for about two weeks until the chemists change it. Once they change the structure, it's back on the market because you can buy it legally. It's, a, it's unfortunate, it's a sad game, but it's a business uh, environment. It has nothing to do with wanting to get high or, or deliver this information. When you talk about carfentanil, it's so potent that individuals are becoming um, contaminated by that. And actually, police officers are overdosing on the way back to the police station. EMS have picked up overdose victims in the street and have crashed their ambulances because they've actually gone into an overdose episode driving the rigs back to the hospital because it's so potent and it can be up in the air, if you just brush your hands and it's aerosol, you get it into your lungs, you could absolutely be impacted by this. And the hospitals are experiencing this throughout the country right now. When you look at the packaging, they stamp it with their own marks from the different drug dealers so they know what they're looking for. I'm looking for the Mega Million. I know what street corner that's on. That's what I want. But if I've been buying that and then I buy it tomorrow and they mixed it with another type of byproduct, it could kill me. Back in June in our hospital, we are, we're at right outside of the city of Trenton, so we've got an inner city population, but we're about three miles away where Robert Wood Johnson Hamilton is. And we started to see an uptick of overdoses last year, people being pulled off the street, thrown into the rigs, and brought into the ER. Around June, we said to the e EMTs, you know, we're not seeing as many ambulance rigs coming in with the overdoses. What's going on? And they said, because when we get to the scene now, they're not even revivable. So they go right to the ME. So it's not that, oh, hey, it stopped. We're not seeing it at the ER. It's because it's such a crisis that they're going right to the ME now. So it's, it's unfortunate. They'll crush them up. They'll put them into pill stamps. Uh, so when your staff's out there, if you're doing a um, uh, medication check on a patient that's come in with their own, how many patients come in with just baggies of this and that? I couldn't tell you the stuff my mom used to have. Um, I think she was a drug dealer. Just kidding. But people have that stuff, loose pockets and Ziploc bags. And you have to understand when you're giving that to the pharmacy for a medications check that you're looking and you know what you're looking at or handling because it might not be that. When you look at the spectrum of people that are exposed, uh, healthcare providers and hospitals is right there at the second to last level of exposure. The very top is the first responders, entry teams. So those guys and girls that are going into a, a drug house, absolutely potential for that overdose exposure. EMTs picking somebody up on the street, putting them in the rig, and now they're exposed. When you drop down, the uh, suppliers and the street dealers, those people are succumbing to this because they're handling the product, and they don't realize how potent it is, and they're dying on the street when they're trying to sell it. So that's happening. Hospital workers, staff, forensic labs. In New Jersey, two uh, state police in the hooded tents in the, in the um, areas where they do all their testing, with that level of protection, they became exposed and went into an overdose and had to be rushed to a hospital, and that's out of the state police laboratory where they have the hoods and the proper gowning and PPE, so it's out there. And then your chemical, uh, excuse me, your commercial transport, intermediate transport, because this stuff's being found in buses, it's being found on Ubers, uh, taxis, and the like. Uh, the drug safety recommendations for responders, a lot of this is just your same PPE, so this would be just make sure you've got the right things on, respirators, masks, gloves, gowns, Active shooter, we're going to quickly go through this because it's, it's unfortunate that we've heard so much about it that we think we know about it. But the changing from the Homeland Security component from active shooter to really active killings because it's not just about coming in with a gun. You're seeing, unfortunately, what we heard from the uh, earlier presentation, the vehicle that rammed in to the um, 
protest. Uh, back in February, I believe it was February of last year, 18, there was a Connecticut hospital that an individual filled the car full of gasoline containers, lit himself on fire, and drove right into the entrance to the ER. Anyone familiar with that uh, occurrence? Um, so that occurred. We've seen the bike path in New York City a, a year, a little over a year ago on that Halloween weekend. So those types of people are out there, and they're trying to do harm. So we want to get away from the act of shooting and really talk about act of killing. Uh, when you talk about hospital shootings, yes, they happen. Yes, they've occurred in some of your hospitals in, in Massachusetts. They've occurred in some of my local hospitals in, in New Jersey. But when you take away the component of what's those terrible things in the news, uh, and here's just a snapshot of some recent things that occurred. The most recent were the two hospitals in South Carolina in that same week back in uh, April. But the takeaway on those factors is that we are relatively safe when it comes to the active shooter definition. Active shooter is somebody coming in here with the intent to kill as many people, not knowing any of us. That type of action to date, there's only been seven that's documented under the FBI guidelines between 2000 and 2015 when they did the last update of hospital active shooter incidents. The incidents that we occur are these one-offs, it's the strained relationships, it's the I have it out for the physician, or I have it out for my estranged wife or husband, and those are the types of relationships or gun-related incidences that you might be more uh, in tune to experience in the hospital versus those active shooter events. And how do you drill for those? And I told my senior leadership, we'll never do an active shooter drill. And they looked at me and said, well, that's what we hired you for. And I put it in the context that if this is our ER, and I say, come through those doors with a pretend gun, bang, bang, you're dead, you fall down, you do this. These events are over in between four and eight minutes. And what value does that now give labor and delivery? What value did that just give to food and nutrition? Because in this type of a situation, it's mass hysteria, panic, and we just have to follow those protocols of run, hide, and fight. The real training and exercise is bringing you to the realistic understanding and awareness of these events, how to respond, and then going into your local units in a healthy environment to speak about what would you do, how would you react, respond. Because if you just try to do it as a drill, it's a, it's a waste because you're not going to get the true outcome that you need because how do you drill to everybody just get out of your seats and run? That's not the drill. It's more about the recovery, that media attention that's going to be on there. How do you get back to a service line? How do you go back into that ER and do your job when you've got the body outlines and what you just witnessed? So there's a lot more to it than just that four to eight minute window of a active shooter event. Peter, I'll go ahead and stop there and allow any questions. Sure. So I, I want to go back and, and call you on something. Sure. The active shooter drill, which we've all been taught is the thing to do, and you just stood up here and said, not going to do it. Not going to do it. And I just want to hear again, because I think that's a big, uh, that's my headline of sure. your talk here so far, is your whole talk was great, but that was a real takeaway. Tell us again, I understand the three elements of the active shooter drill, sure. but isn't it make sense to still go through that process for people? Absolutely. So they're just aware. So Absolutely. Maybe so refine that a little bit or, so when or I say come back to that. I, I'm not going to do a drill. And that's putting it in the context of what we're used to in the emergency management drill that we've become aware of is the, the alarm goes off and we run to the boardroom to set up incident management and make sure I get my vest. And how do we do this? And who's assigned to uh, all those hierarchies of ICS? Is the incident command. And then on your units, where would you go? What would you do? To do it to that level of an exercise, it would be unrealistic. Yes, you could do it, but you're going to miss so many true opportunities to educate and provide the absolute knowledge to respond and how to respond. So what we do, example, at the, at the hospital that I'm at is instead of taking a, a component for a drill period and say, all right, go, I announce that, hey, next Thursday, throughout the entire week, I'm doing active shooter awareness training. And it's an hour presentation. It's in our auditorium. I come in at 2 in the morning and teach it. I come in at 4 in the morning and teach it. Shift changes. And I've had, at our hospital, we've got about 1,200 employees, and to date, 800 have gone through it, 800 employees. And it's not mandatory. We've not made it mandatory. But what it is is I share this information. I share there's a little bit more to this presentation, and unfortunately there's a little bit time uh, sensitive here. But it, I take them through an understanding and the realistics of what is an active shooter, and truly are we vulnerable to that. 
And then what are we really at risk for? And once they have that awareness and knowledge and comfort level of knowing that I'm going to run, hide, and fight, and well, what if I abandon my patient? And will I be held accountable? I have a duty to care. We cover all those topics in a healthy dialogue to share that information. Then, following that, I will go to the different nursing units and then openly, again, not just walk on with a pretend gun or a ball or something and say, what do you do? Because, again, you never know how you're going to do. We saw from the Parkland shooting, there was some focus and blame put to the police officers because they didn't go in. Unless you've ever been in a situation, and I can speak to that having been federal law enforcement and having something under my suit besides a radio, you don't know how you're going to respond, even with all the training in the world. When something that horrific is happening, we're human too. So there's a component that you can't say, this is what you do, A, B, and C. So you have to have the healthy discussions, go on to a nursing unit, gather them at the, at the nurse's station and say, okay, here's the situation. Somebody just came off the elevator and they're walking this way with a gun actively shooting. Where would you go? Med room right there, here's the code. I would go in here and lock the door. I'd put the brakes on the bed. And th then you got them thinking, but not in a drill scenario where we all lose sight of what we're really doing and just check a box and then we're good. So that's why I say you won't very, do it. Very, very helpful won't do a uh, clarification. So again, microphones here. Um, I thought this presentation was terrific, but opened up a lot of questions that I'm sure that you might have as you're sitting there pondering um, what, uh, what was just said. How do you talk about security, though, in the hospital environment? I mean, you just sound so hands-on and like every CEO's gift to security. But how do you really do it to take people and, and take them aside? You go in and you talk to your nurses and you talk to your ED team, whatever that may be. How do you carve out that time? How do folks, do you have the time to have your security team come in and, and talk to your nurses and all of that? Is that, is that happening? Is that happening on a pretty regular basis? Maybe you could shed some more light on it. Sure. So a lot of it is kind of discussions from the earlier presentations, like who should be the public speaker? Should it be that CEO? Should I be the spokesperson because I've got this experience and my dedication and passion for safety security? And the answer is no. Uh, absolutely, I'm a resource for all the staff. So uh, what I've shared first and foremost is you got to know your own vulnerabilities. So I brought my security team in and said, where are you guys screwed up? How come nurses hate you? How come you're not providing the services that they expect or demand? And then we get the whole, how come they come here with a wheelchair full of belongings after a month and they throw it on our desk? And so we go through all those issues, but then you have to break it down that everybody's got issues, but how do you do it? So what I've shared with the security staff is instead of just waiting to be called, and that's the first time you see them, on your round, stop at the nurse's station and say, hey, while I'm here, any, any issues, any disruptive family, uh, any problems? Build those relationships so, and check in. A lot of times we don't want to know because then I've got to do something. And I, 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 every day before I leave the office at, at 4.35 o'clock, and usually I'm still there till 9, but at 4.30 I will walk every nursing unit. And whoever I see that's in a scrub or a tech, hey, have a great afternoon, have a good evening. Any issues I should be concerned about? If you need us, call. My guys are ready. Hey, I saw you got a visitor restriction in two. Uh, now you know. Our doors aren't always 100% protected, so when that person does show up, don't call and say, why'd you let this person through the door? Because it's a whole ownership. If you see the person in the unit that knows there's a visitor restriction, don't get upset and scream at us for not doing our job. There's 42 doors in the hospital, and only two are manned by security. Somebody can get in some way, somewhere. We know that. It's a public area. It's no different than a shopping mall. It happens. And we can't be in that negative, reactive mode that we're unsafe. We are a very safe environment in the hospitals in the totality of everything. But build those relationships, go to the nursing units, speak to them, and I guarantee you a lot of times they don't want to know what you're saying until you say that right key phrase or you tie it into something that's realistic. If you just go up and say, hey, we're safe, if you need us, call, you're not building those relationships. But if you go up there and make a personal connection, I know last night, uh, unfortunately, um, Bill, I understand you were swatted and scratched by the patient in two. I understand it was a dementia patient. It really wasn't an aggressive act, but still it's not tolerable. It happened to you and you need to report it because if I don't tell the CEO that everybody up here every night is getting scratched, then they're not going to give me the manpower for FTEs. And again, it's not about FTEs because I could even have 100 security officers in uniform. You're still going to have these types of behaviors happening and the issues happening. So we all have to have our eyes and ears out there and the comfort level to address them. When a crisis happens, there's always 
one or two or three, and the more that step forward are, creates more chaos. But in terms of who's in control, because I always got the sense like security wanted to be in control because you're security. But in a hospital environment, how do you balance that security versus healthcare professional sure. in terms of taking control in a situation where security has been called? So the way we take control is absolutely at the direction of nursing. Because as I shared with you, a security officer has no authority or jurisdiction. You might think, because we wear a uniform and have a radio or, or, or different aspects of our um, components of what we do in our job, there's that misconception and, and false perception of what we can and cannot do. And it's based on different states. So I use, for example, um, uh, tasers. Back in 2011, there was an incident in Texas that occurred in a Texas hospital. The officers used their tasers. And then every time I walked the halls in a hospital in New Jersey, I was told, why don't we have tasers? Why don't we have tasers? Well, New Jersey didn't allow tasers even in their police department until 2012. And now there's still protocols and specifics on the attorney general's use of a taser. So we just can't go buy tasers. When you look at handcuffs, handcuffs are mandated under CMS uh, through, if you're joint commission regulated and through the protocols that they are not to be used in patient care control settings. There's a whole section written on that. So you can't apply them. And then state laws are going to dictate further how you could apply them in, in other types of situations, if it is a custodial handoff to police. But who's in control, to answer that question specific, Peter, is the nursing staff. Because we are there for the care and the health of these individuals. And we have to take the guidance, and we'll be supportive. So if you need a patient restraint, then you need to make sure there's an order, and you provide us the guidance of what you want, four-point restraint, two-point restraint. If it's 8 o'clock at night and visiting hours are over and you can't get this family to leave, then you need to tell us. It's after hours this family needs to go. Don't just say, we need you up here and then leave, and then there's nobody to provide us direction. And the last thing I'll share on that component of authority level, everything in our hospital, and this comes from my leadership back to my staff, when we call the police, everything we do, it's because you're trespassing. It means nothing of what you did to cause it. So when I get the call to go to the nurse's unit that the patient's taking their picture, they're videotaping, there's no law against that. There's absolutely no law against it. It's unsettling at times, and what are you going to do with it, and where are you going to post it? We have different policies in our hospital regarding photos. But if they won't delete it and won't adhere to it, then I ask you to leave my hospital. If you refuse to leave, I call the police and say they refuse to leave my hospital, they're trespassing, and they drag them out. If I say they won't stop taking pictures, the cops are going to go, and? If it's, they won't stay out of the pantry, they keep taking the crackers, the graham crackers, you know, they're filling up their lunch bag to go home. We can't do anything about that. So you're going to leave because of your behavior. I'm not leaving this hospital. Trespassing, out the door they go. Everything comes back to a trespassing charge because now it's because they refuse to leave, and most of the time they're going to act in that manner towards the police. And my experience in hospitals 11 years, the majority of these perpetrators already have a warrant for them. So when they run their name, they don't even need to know what they did here. So they already take them. Great. Thanks for that. Um, let me ask you all a question. This is something that I actually do in, in my media training. Um, I ask uh, healthcare professionals uh, this question. What if you walk into a patient's room and they decide to take out their phone and they say they want to share with their family the interaction that they're having with you? And this has been a patient that perhaps maybe has questioned some of the care or diagnosis that he or she has received. And they want to show you live stream, Facebook, whatever, and on the other end of the phone, they say, oh, the people on the other end of the phone are just my family. But what they don't tell you is there might be a malpractice lawyer on the other end listening in. Who has a policy to deal with that now? Can somebody share their policy? What is the, what, it, would you mind taking the mic and just, what, what's your policy around that? Could somebody share that? Unfortunately, Peter, I raised my hand. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want, anybody want to? Are we, uh, we going to come to the mic? No. All right. You're up. You're going to share so, your policy. Uh, over the last year and a half with, obviously, social media and the onset of all the different changes of our environment and photographs and everybody has a camera, uh, we had a lacking policy that really didn't cover 
the photograph issues and the videotaping. So ours is carved out that if you want to take a picture, and that's, I'll use maternity, you had a baby, you want the family, it, it, it's a reasonable request to have photos. If the caregivers uh, acknowledge that they're okay to be in the picture, the physicians, the nurses, the staff, then it's appropriate. And our policy guideline just says they can't add, include anything that shares other people's information. So if you're in a double room, there's something written on a whiteboard, that information has to make sure you don't capture that. So in our rooms, we have a signed posting that we honor and welcome photographs and sharing of the positives of your, relation, of your experiences. But if you are going to use those, that you contact us for further guidance. Then in our disclosure, when we give them the policy, it's also in the handbook when you arrive in your patient uh, information. It talks about the live streaming and video, which is that is not allowed. So we do not allow, according to policy, live streaming. When you get the policy, again, it's not law. So that becomes that struggle. If I say, well, tough, I'm going to film it, what can you do? And that's right. where it has to be, you're going to have to leave then. But the piece about the filming is in most of the things when we deal with, 99% of the time the people will become compliant. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Sure, I'll delete that. I've had many people just delete things, delete, 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 the dirt on the floor, this or that, whatever it might be that they're upset about. It's how you, you know, interact with them. It comes back to that de-escalation of verbal skills because I can get those people to comply. It's the 1% that are going to be more of a trouble and film you on the way out screaming and yelling because they don't want to comply. And, and, and those are going to be the problem cases that you're going to find. So I just think it's, it's something of this day and age that is going to happen more and more. And, and I do think having a policy sure makes sense. But like you said, when, a, when somebody says to their doctor, what, you're not going to allow me to do this to my family? What's, what's wrong here? So again, you don't know who's on the other end of this. So anyway, not, certainly not something we're going to answer today. Um, I want to end this section with Bob by asking him probably the most important question that has, uh, he might have ever been asked in his life. Bob, what color are you? What color am I? I am blue. So was I. Calming. Is that what that means? Yeah. Okay. And, my, and I'll share my animal. My animal was a puppy dog. Whoa. Loyal. Oh, Loyal, dedicated, always there for you. And it, it, it matched up to me. So I don't want to know what anybody else is. If you see me afterwards for network, and I'll tell you what the third thing is. And that's think of a body of water and then come talk to me. Okay. I'm not sure I'm going there. Great Thank job. You. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Well done.